problem. So my apologies. That's why I wasn't getting back to you. So sorry. Okay. okay. But anyhow, we're good. We're good. We've got 45 minutes. Um, I will start. I'll introduce myself and I'll introduce uh, all of you. Well, I'll probably introduce uh, all of you first and then me. No, I guess I can probably say me first. Okay. So I, guess, I don't know if they'll give us a cue or not, but I'll go. As soon as it's 12. Okay, well, as as it's 12 30. Yeah. We got 10 people already. Okay, so we'll see what our streaming is going to be. Yeah, I don't know what That's all right. As long as they can see me, okay. let's not mess with it. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to mess with it and lose no, it. As long as they can there. see me now. Gentlemen, I'm not seeing everybody else. So I'm just going to pretend like I'm seeing you. I don't want to mess with it and lose anything. So um, I'll just be looking straight ahead. And my apologies for the technical problems on my end. I'm very sorry about this. I have no idea why, but here we are. Is it 12.30 yet? It is 12.29. Let me know at 12.30, I'll just start. You got it. I wonder if there's a sign, if they know when they give you a signal. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Beth Mendelson. I'm a senior executive producer from Voice of America, and I have the pleasure of introducing this extremely distinguished panel. And I'd like to begin uh, with Michael Hacking, who's the Chief Executive Officer and, and Founder of MoPo from Switzerland. Mets, Mats Hellstrom, the former Minister for Foreign, Foreign Trade from Sweden. Alexander Kulitz, member of the German Parliament, and, uh, member of the German Parliament. Jonathan Reckford, Chief Executive Officer, Habitat for Humanity International. And Steve Wow, uh, from Johns Hopkins University, the Applied Physics Lab, USA. I'm going to begin with a question for each of our panelists. Um, we're going to be discussing um, uh, inspiring a new deal on globalization. And my first question, which I'm going to ask for a quick response for, from everyone. Uh, globalization has shaped the modern world of economic challenge, but COVID-19 has left it weakened. Some observers argue the pandemics could unravel globalization altogether. How can we inspire a new deal on globalization um, as you see it from your point of view, gentlemen? Uh, let me first go with to Michael. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity of, of, uh, of discussing this. Um, it's very much appreciated. I must say that the last panel I was involved in for Harassis, which was last year, it was um, it was very interesting because it was in person, and I have to say that within within uh, a few moments there was a fight between the audience and the panel. I think this time, of course, between us we won't be able to fight. So uh, I'm very pleased about that. that we're, we've got some distance here, um, but but my experience is very much uh, in Africa, um, and I've been very focused on Africa. So a lot of uh, the position I take here is going to be very much on the African side of things and how globalization uh, has really impacted very negatively on Africa. Um, and and I really don't see any advantage uh, of that at all. And furthermore, that combined with, uh, uh, oh, we can do a selfie, but not now. Um, uh, and that combined with uh, the pandemic that we have at the present time has created tremendous difficulties in Africa today. Um, and and I'll be talking about that uh, as we go through this uh, this particular session. Um, I, I think I'll leave it at that, okay. uh, just to introduce myself. Thank you, it Michael. will be very much from the African perspective. Thank you, Michael, I, and thank you for setting the stage for that. Mats, may, uh, may you please weigh in on this? Yes. <clears throat> First, though, <laughs> question. I can't see anybody. <laughs> so, 
Oh, I see you. I'm, I'm seeing you. So I think we can all hear you. So that's that's fine. If you could, if you could but answer, I, I think we'll be able to do that. On the, on the question, I think that can pandemic we have now shows, of course, very much that we need multilateral cooperation and that we need globalization to find solutions. But not just because of what we are seeing now. We will also have other pandemics coming in, in, the, in the future, and we must be prepared to fight them also. That also requires, of course, very strong cooperation now. And uh, therefore, of course, with the uh, Trump administration's fight against multilateralism in different ways, it's counterproductive. Okay, um, Alexander, would you would you weigh in now, please, sir? Well, um, first of all, I also want to thank you on this panel today because I'm very happy that the Horatius takes place, even though it's not in person and only online. But I think it's very, very important that we have these discussions. Um, personally, I think that the COVID-19, um, the main challenge is actually not the, the virus itself. It's more or less a situation that has been catalyzed by this uh, virus. We have two problems we already have this before. And um, COVID-19 is actually only catalyzing many of these issues like nationalistic or protectionistic um, um, movements that already arose before COVID. And um, the, the coronavirus is only a catalyzer, um, if you want to, for all these issues. So we will have to find means and ways to, um, well, to, to not only solve the corona crisis, but way more to solve or to forward the globalization. Um, we definitely need to, to, to engage on this. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Jonathan? Thank you. Glad to be with you all. I'm a more of a tempered optimist. I think the we can't just reverse, and I would certainly agree with the colleagues who would say both not just pandemics, but so many other aspects cross, don't respect geographic boundary lines in our digital world. And so I think we need to make the moral case as well as the economic and political case for globalization, um, but also recognize that in some ways did, we may not have done enough to counter some of the impacts on more vulnerable people in, uh, in different contexts of globalization and figure out how do we do it, it better with a multi-sector approach. I think it's going to take civil society, private sector, and the public sector, because uh, I don't think any one of the sectors can actually manage this uh, independently. Okay. Steve, uh, would you give us your thoughts, please? Sure, I have to uh, apologize for uh, the destruction noise in the background. But uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to, uh, to join this panel. So I, I think it's instructive that we actually have some divergent viewpoints on whether or not globalization is good or bad. If, it's, if it hasn't been good uh, for some small nations or emerging nations in, in Africa, but we believe that it's, it's vital, uh, on the other hand, from some European perspective, I think that is the, the, the nub of the problem is, is that we need to understand where is the equity in it for everyone. And that's the best way. If you want to, if you want to stoke globalization, if you want to, if you want to encourage uh, an international perspective, we have to be able to explain to everyone why it's in their best interests. So I, I would ask, you know, why do we think people voted for Brexit? Why do we think people uh, vote for you know, populists? And if you can answer those questions and then be able to explain to them, no, here's, here's why these things are in your best interests. You have a better opportunity of making it work. But we need to understand the equities from both ends of the equation. So what I would tell you as uh, an American politician is that nobody in the United States is going to come from globalization. Not a Democrat, not a Republican. You're not going to hear people out there saying, I'm all for globalization. What we have to be able to do is to break it down into its component elements and then say, here's, here's why it's in your best interest. And for example, in the COVID era specifically, let's look at a lot of nations that, and everyone's equally suffering from the pandemic, but a lot of nations don't have the capacity to respond. They don't necessarily have the capacity to do the research. They don't necessarily have the capacity to, uh, to make all the vaccines that are required. That is, that is distributed throughout the world. 
So we need to be able to explain to people at home, here's why it's in our best interest to have really good relations with, for example, India that has a gigantic capacity to, uh, to make vaccines. Here's why we want to have a, a great relationship with countries like Taiwan that have very effectively controlled the spread of the virus inside of their, uh, inside of their borders. So that's what I would say we need to, we need to take care is, is to understand what those equities are and don't just, don't look and dismiss people who say, well, I don't like, uh, I don't like globalization. We need to understand why they don't like it and then be able to address those questions. Thank you very much, Steve. I think, you know, because you all come from a very diverse uh, background, um, and I think we can all agree that the COVID-19 situation has been difficult on every level for industry, for, you know, for, for business, for politics. We're all kind of struggling with that. Um, I wanted to go to you, Jonathan, now and, and, and uh, ask you something about, since you're with Habitat for Humanity, um, you said we, we were experiencing a global housing crisis before COVID-19 and the pandemic has exasperated that and that many people have lost incomes. It's been a big struggle. From your point of view, can you talk to us about uh, the global housing uh, issue and how it's impacted your organization and the people you work with? Thank you, Beth. So you had, you've got multiple massive trends uh, colliding before COVID and then COVID on top of that. So if you think about rapid urbanization and climate change, both were change, creating huge in-country as well as country-to-country -country migration. And then you, the trend of rapid urbanization meant you have massive numbers of people moving into cities that didn't have the infrastructure for their current population, let alone their projected population. And so we have mega cities now all around the world uh, that have far more people than they have the, the infrastructure for and the housing for, meaning we've got over a billion people in urban slums, and that's projected to continue to grow. We've got 1.8 billion people living in substandard housing. And, uh, and so COVID then came in and made all that worse. Now, if you take, I was talking to national directors, if you take a place like Cambodia or the Philippines, not only are they shut down economically for a long time, though Cambodia is beginning to reopen, uh, they lost... Uh, all of their tourism dollars, and then their foreign workers were largely lost jobs and sent home, so they lost their remittance income as well. So not only is COVID a direct hit, the economic spill-off effects are devastating. And for those of us who are knowledge workers and can shelter in place and continue to do our work, that works. For people who can't eat if they can't uh, move and can't shelter in place because they don't have adequate shelter, uh, this is really a catastrophe. And so I think um, as much as there is a trend towards nationalism and the real need for each country to deal with COVID in its own environment, uh, we need a huge increase, I believe, in, in foreign aid and international support because we're not going to solve COVID everywhere un unless we can create the, con the health conditions. And uh, to me, that includes housing so that people can actually be safe. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Matt, so I want to go to you right now and ask you about uh, the role of the WHO and WTO in trying to, to combat the virus and trying to create infrastructure with communities to deal with this situation. Uh, the U.S. president, as we all know, is looking to, uh, looking to uh, minimize the role of these institutions. How do you feel about this? I think we lost Matt. Matt, are you still with us? I'll come back to Matt if we've if we've lost him. Let me let me move on to Michael and ask him, uh, since his expertise is in Africa, uh, what's the impact of COVID nineteen Matt's and the virus and the virus on uh, on economic growth in Africa right now as you see it? Michael, are you still with yeah. me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, just I'm, I'm muting very quickly. Okay. Um, did you hear the question? Do you want me to? I did. I no. I heard the question. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Um, in the past five years, there've been uh, four epidemics in Africa: um, HIV/AIDS, Ebola, H H one N one, COVID nineteen, uh, and now recently in Nigeria, there's a new epidemic that's totally unknown, uh, but it's substantially more dangerous than COVID nineteen, and it's called laser fever. The mortality rate of this laser fever is 23% of those who get it. It's huge. Uh, whereas with COVID-19, as we know, it's about 2%. So 
So, and in the last nine weeks, uh, sorry, in the first nine weeks of 2020, there were more cases of laser fever than there were in the whole of 2019. So you've got a deadly virus and spreading very fast, uh, which is quite scary. Uh, however, COVID-19 is hitting Africa's most vulnerable people the hardest. Food insecurity has increased alarm alarmingly, and the economic recession is likely to push an additional 23 million people into extreme poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. This pandemic is disrupting government revenues, foreign direct investment, development assistance, remittance, trade, tourism. And on top of that, they had the uh, oil crisis uh, of February where the price uh, collapsed at the time. The social impact of this virus is not, significant, is not as significant in, Europe, in Africa as it is in the West. This does not mean that uh, to, to translate that life is less important, but rather the fact that they have so many viruses and that life expectancy in Africa is much lower than in developed nations. Hmm. The average uh, life expectancy in Africa for those born in 2019, unbelievably, is 61 for men and 65 for women, whereas in Europe or in the West, it's 76 and 81. Okay. Um, Nationalism is, is, is playing such a strong role in all this. Um, and it's really, really disappointing to see how uh, the Western nations, are, uh, even as far as finding the right uh, vaccine, are uh, saying we want to make money out of this. Uh, and interestingly, when you look at the Chinese, the Chinese are saying we will give the vaccine to Africa if and when we can find it, we'll give the vaccine. So nationalism is playing a strong role and globalization is second fiddle to the self-interest of various nations and companies. But this nationalism, sorry, this nationalism is not just evident in the development of the vaccine, but also as far as environmental issues that we see in the world today. You know, it's not a we don't see it as a global problem. The refugee problem in Europe and economic tariffs, which are uh, established against uh, exports from Africa. So Africa is very much a forgotten continent in all these discussions, I'm afraid, Beth. Thank you for thank you for sharing that and the and talking about nationalism, which is going to be a perfect segue. As I'm going to go to Alexander, and uh, I wanted to talk to him that Germany has has been touted as one of the leaders uh, in in the COVID management, and I wanted to to ask how Germany and the inner in the EU have been interfacing on this issue and how globalization has been perceived by the German government and why you've been able to be effective uh, in, com in combating the situation. Alexander, are you hearing me okay? Sorry, I was still on mute. Um, okay. Beth, quite a hard question. Um, let me start with how do we see globalization? Yeah. Well, how do governments experience globalization? After all, we are one of the big winners on globalization right. in total. I mean, looking at our economy, we are a trading nation. We are very dependent on free and open markets, and our economy only survives or it only performs the way it does due to the fact that we have this uh, global um, value trading all over the, the, the world. Um, still, there is quite a lot of um, resistance nowadays also when it comes to the question of globalization because we see that there is some things that do not work out the way we expect them to be. After all, globalization led to a growth in wealth international-wise. We have um, um, even poor countries, we have less um, deaths by starving, we have less issues globally, definitely, but the unequal uh, equality worldwide has grown over the last years, and in Germany we do see this. Um, stating that Germany is uh, very good at management when it comes to the COVID, uh, the corona crisis. Um, well, Europe, I think, at the beginning didn't do a very good job because we've seen, and also us in Germany, very quickly that we had some nationalistic uh, thinking and ideas within Europe, which uh, obviously should not happen in the European Union. So uh, Germany shut down its supplies to some of our partners in the European Union very quickly in February already, in March. That should never have happened. So we do have to tackle this issue as a European question for the future. 
But looking at Germany, a federal state, it's already still fighting this pandemic is not a question of the federal government. It's actually a question on the state level. So the prime ministers have a saying of the states, of the different states have a saying on what measures they take against COVID. And um, up to now, we dealt very well with the illness, but we have a very, very good health system. Uh, and I think um, there was a little bit of luck also to it. Um, there are some states who are more infected than others, such as Bavaria. They were the most strict ones when it came to the measures. So I'm not quite sure whether Germany should be a role model when it comes to tackling COVID. I would say we were rather lucky at the beginning, but we'll, we're not through. We're not done yet with this pandemic. So we'll see what happens in the end. And um, there's a German saying, you should not um, praise the day before the dawn. So um, let's see what, what still happens with the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Steve, I'm going to go to you now. And when we spoke, you have said that uh, industry and government leaders must work to establish a framework for an independent international organization with a focus on cybersecurity, which is one of your areas of expertise. Um, should that same model apply for COVID? What do you see as a better as a better way to approach the COVID situation? So, as I said uh, earlier, I think the uh, the game for us here is to recognize where our strengths are and how they're distributed across the world. And the first part of that is to say, you know, I need to be able to, to identify my own strengths, but I also need to be able to identify my own weaknesses. And I need to be able to, uh, I need to be brave enough and bold enough to say that, you know, perhaps the, uh, the best code research is being done in Brussels. Maybe it's not being done in Stanford. Um, and, and I might be able to say that perhaps the, uh, the best, the best opportunity for production of a, of a vaccine or a treatment uh, might be in India uh, or it, it, it might be in China. And we, we need to be bold enough to ad admit where there are other places and other people that are strong. And then occasionally, you know, we may have the best and brightest researchers. Uh, and I hate to say Stanford, but maybe it's Johns Hopkins. But uh, we, we may have the best uh, researchers on hold, but if the breakthrough comes from uh, a researcher in the Congo, you're, you're an idiot if you turn it down. We need, to, we need to be willing to take those bold leaps and then recognize here's the opportunity, this is the breakthrough, and this is going to be good for us if we accept help uh, from uh, other nations and other places. So, so as we're talking, I think I want everybody to feel comfortable to kind of jump in right now because I think we've made a, you know, everybody's presented their points of view. And I, I guess I wanted to go back to Jonathan uh, and ask him this question. What is it that you see in common with the other colleagues who are speaking today in terms of the challenges of running your business in this COVID environment? I mean, you know, from what everybody's saying, is it nationalism? Is, you know, what, what do you see is the biggest challenge that your company's having? Um, and, and what's similar to what your other colleagues are talking about here? You know, I think the, the biggest challenge um, is just the disruption. So the inability for people to travel, the inability, even now construction in many places has been exempted as a, as a urgent necessity. And so some construction can take place, but where people were required to shelter in place, that absolutely shut down work altogether. And it has been, um, so operational disruption, I think has been huge for everyone. And, and I would say it's a split world. So the knowledge workers, have been able to, you know, for, for me, I can work from home. So many of our folks have fairly seamlessly been able to work remotely, but obviously we're a construction uh, and community development organization. So that actual work of in the communities all over the world, huge amount of that has been disrupted. We did a heavy pivot to focusing on uh, water sanitation and hygiene because that was viewed as the most urgent thing in terms of, of helping communities uh, navigate and get through safely. Uh, the COVID crisis, but it has been, um, and I think on the long term, there'll be positives of how so many organizations have learned how to work better virtually, actually work across uh, different barriers well, but near term, it's uh, we've never faced something where all of the world was impacted at the same time versus a big disaster in one place or another that we had to, to grapple with. So it has been, I think, for whether NGOs or companies, um, that are doing on the ground work. This has been enormously disruptive. And I think the economic impacts 
that we're talking about then start having spillover effects. So if a family loses their job, they can't pay their mortgage or their housing loan, uh, that starts to create an impact uh, that ripples all the way through. So I think that the interconnectedness of all these pieces, uh, if remittances don't come in, that takes income out of the community. If uh, And then there are even the side pieces that people often don't think about with community development where we're seeing huge increases in mental health uh, challenges. We're seeing increases in domestic violence. We're seeing increases in, in a lot of other side aspects that are directly attributable to COVID but, but aren't part of the direct statistics people see. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Anybody else want to chime in on that? Well, uh, speaking to the question of trade in the COVID era, I think part of our problem has been that because it was a novel virus and no one really knew uh, you know, how can I how can I get infected, how can I pass this infection, is that I think people sort of retreated and uh, avoided exposure to things. We need to be we need to convince the world that no no you know if if goods are put into a shipping container and and they're riding on a ship across the Atlantic. Uh, Three weeks later, when they get where they're going, you're not going to get infected. We can, we can continue with trade. We can move goods. We can move raw materials. We need to, we need to have the economy moving for exactly the reason that Jonathan was saying is, is that, uh, you know, the poverty will kill people that, that the virus, the virus does not. So we, we've got to get this economy going. And that means for everybody. But, uh, Steve, could I just, uh, add something there? Um, I, I think the problem with with this whole vaccine story is the self interest of the uh, of the um, of the companies that are trying to develop it and the nations which are trying to develop the vaccines, and and I think that this is capitalism going wrong at the present time, and that it should in fact be that everybody should be collecting collectively trying to find a solution uh, for this for the vaccine in fact, uh, and I think uh, Bill Gates was uh, was quoting this. Um, that everybody should be much more collaborative, that there's no such thing as a national solution to a global crisis. All, cr- all countries must work together uh, to end the pandemic and to rebuilding economies. The longer it takes to realize that, the longer it will take and the more it will cost to get back on our feet. And this is, this is a fundamental problem. Um, it, it's because we're in a capitalistic world um, with globalization and all these things, I think, are actually against what we need today. Uh, I think, as as uh, I think it was Martin Wolf today said earlier on in one of the in, the, in one of the uh, uh, discussions was saying it, we must be much more inclusive, um, and businesses must have that feeling towards the community and not self interest. So I, I I think that's true, but the game is is that. And, and let me put it to you this way: so. We we have a sitting member of the uh, the Bundestag here, and I'm sure that one of his imperatives is to make sure that you know German federal you know dollars are invested with German businesses to try to save German lives. I I think that that's what his his voters would want him to do. But at the same time, is that if you know if a vaccine emerges from outside of Germany, his voters will absolutely demand that. He get that for them as fast as possible. That so that, then I think it's kind of the, there's there's a balance uh, in the the capital's aspects and that we have to encourage our own our own countries within or companies within our borders to pursue their interests. But then at the same time, you got to do the right thing for the people. Well, Steve, let me step in there because I think that's quite an interesting um, a thought you also put on the table. Um, we have this issue, especially with a company uh, in southern Germany called CureVac, which is a company that is very much engaged in developing a vaccine. And at some point, there was an interest uh, from uh, the American government to buy into CureVac. And something very, very interesting happened. I'm talking about the capitalistic measures and the market working. Um, the owners in Germany, we have a very different structure when it comes to our economy. So most of our companies are small and medium sized and are owned either by one person or by a family. And this is a very, very sustainable way of having a companies growing over, centru- over the century, actually. it's a, I'm a third generation family entrepreneur. We actually manufacture a few dust extractors for the industry. Now this CureVac, fa- uh, CureVac uh, company was also a family owned company. And at some point when America said they want to buy in and they want this vaccine for the American market, 
the family stepped in and said, no, wait, this is not what we're developing the vaccine for. This vaccine is for everybody. It's not only for Americans. And they refused the American money. They refused the American investor, not due to economic reasons. Economically, it was perfectly fine and made a lot of sense. Due to value reasons, because this family had so many issues in Germany, people were really... Um, 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 how do you call that, shit mailing them, telling them, well, you are not supposed to sell your company due to this fact. Um, and at some point, the government actually stepped in, the German government, and said, okay, we're not going to allow this deal, but we're going to support you. We need this vaccine as fast as possible, but the vaccine is not exclusively for Europeans or for Germans. Um, it's about creating this vaccine. I think this was quite an interesting case. Um, values are very important in globalization, and I think a global market only works if you consider the values to be part of it. And, and that's a huge discussion we're having in Europe at the moment, the question of human rights, of sustainability, of all these ecological aspects. When we talk about globalization, when we talk about trade, we're not going to solve them, not in Europe, not with international countries, but we have to tackle them globally, every country by its own and all together on a mutual um mutual bilateral or multilateral level. And that's going to be a task as long as we don't reform the WTO or other means of multilateral institutions working together on these issues. We will have a huge challenge, which has nothing to do with COVID because the, the world is getting smaller and globalization will, will forward. But it will also forward the inequalities if we don't work on these values. And I think we have to do it globally. So I wanted to jump in here again and say that You know, this is not the first global crisis that uh, the world has faced. Um, after World War II, uh, multinational institutions like the World Bank and the IMF came together and tried to figure out what they could do to come together and make the world a better place. What do you think the impact of COVID is going to be? Um, and you touched on this a little bit, to bring the world together both to come up with a vaccine and to look at the economic implications and to, to be prepared to move forward uh, in this environment. Who'd like to answer that? There's got to be, I, mean, I guess I'm asking, what are the next steps? What's, what do you foresee uh, coming, out of, coming out of the COVID crisis? I, you know, I, this is far outside my expertise, but the, it's easier to see the problem than the solution. I think in the digital age, it's much easier to destroy institutions than build them up. And there's been a longer trend towards left and right wing, right -wing populism that works against globalization. And, and obviously, um, we've had many leaders across the world, including our country, who have been anti-institutional in terms of these global institutions. It takes a long, long time to build them, and it's quite easy to destroy them. And I think it's going to take... Personally, I think it takes a both and approach. You can't say we're going to focus on the world instead of our problems at home. I don't think that works politically uh, or economically, but I, I think we can make the both and case that they're not mutually exclusive. And in fact, um, if we don't invest in lower income contexts in the global south and other places from the wealthier countries, um, we are going to pay a price. You can't, uh, you can't insulate yourself and put up walls. So I think we're going to have to come back to both the practical case and the moral case for why we need institutions as imperfect as they are. One of my axioms is the only thing worse than partnering is not partnering. So it's really hard. It's messy. It's slow. But it's the only way we're going to ultimately solve these really complex challenges. <clears throat> Isn't it so worse? So that... Sorry? Can I speak? Or... Yeah, please. But isn't it also so that now that people see this global pandemic and can see also that there is, this is one of several pandemics that could come in future. That needs, of course, global co cooperation. And I think and I hope that the anti-multilateralism, now driven by Trump especially, will fail for this reason. More and more people will understand that first we have to fight this COVID globally and the next one that will come needs, of course, a preparation which is global. So in that sense, I am optimistic. Anybody else? 
No, no, no other, no other comments on on this about the fee, about. No, I strongly agree with Matt, yeah. and I think this is why these uh, multilateral institutions are so very important. Looking in this case, when it comes to health, to the World Health Organization, obviously in Geneva. And uh, if we don't fall also, I mean, we are in the 20, on the bridge of the 21st century, more or less. It's the beginning of the digital age. So we very much have to reform many of these multilateral, uh, multilateral institutions. Uh, at the moment, we have a very, and this is also a global notion, we have the, uh, a lot of, of nationalistic, protectionistic, reassuring, decoupling. This is kind of the, the strategy that Donald Trump is, is, uh, is focusing on. I think that the coupling strategy is the worst thing that works in this world at the moment. Why? As long as we are dependent on each other due to trade, due to multilateral agreements, due to um, institutions that we work on together, as long as we are dependent on each other, it's way harder to get in conflict or at least to um, to search for um, the military or other um, uh, solutions on conflicts because it's necessary to negotiate conflict. So this is why we very much need to foster on these multilateral institutions and on trade and on global dependence on each other. So we are forced to negotiate our issues rather than getting other um, options or considering other options to solve our issues. Um, this is why I'm a very strong fan of globalization, a very strong fan of multilateral trade, and I'm not a big fan of decoupling strategies or the idea to break through uh, global value chains. I think this is the worst thing we can do to this globe at this moment. And unfortunately, COVID is, I believe, catalyzing exactly this movement. So we very much have to fight all together that these notions of nationalistic, protectionistic, or even decoupling strategies stop because they won't help anybody. I agree. So let, let, me, let me just tag in on, on that briefly. And the, the game for us is one of the great values that I see in Horasis is that it is a phenomenal place where you can, you can get together and meet with a thousand other people from a hundred different countries and hear lots and lots of people that are very different from your own. That only works if we speak to each other in, in a civil manner. And one of the key aspects, one of the things that we, you know, I believe every multiple races has pressed the I believe button on globalization is good. The game is, is we have to learn how to speak to people who disagree with us in a civil tone, under, you know, listen to what they're saying, try to try to reach them and then present them an argument on here's why it's in your best interest. This is this is why it's going to be good for you. Let me, let me give you just a quick example. Um, I see Africa as a rising continent and there are rising economies and there's enormous opportunities and I hope for the very best in Africa. Um, I would love, as a guy from Maryland, I would love to see Baltimore become the port of destination for Africa to bring raw materials and finished goods into the United States because I think that that would be in our best interests. And as a guy from Southern Maryland, if Baltimore gets better, then that's good for me. So, so Steve, how would you suggest how would you suggest implementing a plan like that? How how would how could something like that work? Well, I'm not entirely sure. I I've been pondering on this for a bit, but I I think part of the game is is that uh, the city of Baltimore has got to kind of get out of its own way and start positioning itself to be the Shanghai of the East Coast. Um, but the other part is is that we have to be able to make a persuasive argument. Uh, to guys like Michael on here's why it's your best in your best interests as, as someone who's representing Africa and representing the equities of Africa. Here's here are the opportunities for you to reach new markets, to grow businesses, to grow trade. This is why it's good for you. And if we can understand that argument, if we, we can say this is this is a win win. So it's good for both sides. And we don't use the word globalization. Then I think you can probably get something done. Steve, I don't know how to transpose that concept into the COVID world, though. That that part really eludes me. Steve, I, you know, I think that's very. It's great to to think like that, and and for sure, if everything was equitable, uh, that could happen. The problem it starts and it's inequitable right to begin with. Um, the European agriculture policy, um, which which uh, maybe Alexander knows a little bit about, but. The European agricultural policy 
uh, absolutely destroys uh, any opportunity for local farmers to grow anything or to develop their own products. Uh, there's a huge amount of dumping which takes place. Uh, it comes under the guise of foreign aid and, and so grain and milk comes in there into Africa. So they have no opportunity to grow and to develop because their economies are destroyed for the benefit of the European market. And this is the obviously the, the agricultural policy, which, as Oxfam said, it's a $30 billion a year uh, subsidy is one of the biggest inequities facing the African farmer. Now, I, I would agree with you. If we could grow vegetables, if we could do certain things in Africa and, and export them to Maryland or to wherever in the States, brilliant. But, you know, you're faced with a huge... Um, um, economic group in Europe that has a policy which impacts extremely negative on Africa. And not only that, in terms of adding value to any of the product which is being made in Africa, if you think in Nigeria, for example, the crude oil, all the crude oil in Nigeria is exported, and then they have to import all the products into Nigeria. And that costs them something like $5 billion a year. That's because there's no incentive to upgrade or to produce there. The same with other, other, other things like, um, like Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire produces something like 2 million tons of cocoa. Ghana next door, 800,000 tons of cocoa next door. And the, and the uh, chocolate industry is $103 billion. But do you know that the average cocoa farmer in the Ivory Coast makes less than a dollar a day. So how do, you, how, how, how do you deal with that? Do you say, okay, uh, we want to make all the chocolate back in Ghana or in the Ivory Coast? But that means that somebody in Switzerland who makes a lot of chocolate or Belgium or wherever mm -hmm. has to give up that opportunity and to bring it back to the home, home, home grounds. It's very difficult. But you know what's happened, of course, is that there is this new uh, structure which has been created in Africa with the 54 countries where they're uniting, in fact, together, uh, and they're breaking down all the boundaries. Uh, and can and, you tell uh, the name of that organization who's doing that? Can you can you be specific? Sorry. Can you tell us the name the name of that con that consortium that's doing that? Yeah, it's 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 all the 54 countries in Africa. In fact, uh, quite a few people are talking about the, the present time. It's it's really important um, because they're, they're it's it's the um, the, the goods, uh, all the goods that are being traded between the countries, uh, and it's early days, uh, Beth, uh, the goods which are being traded are going to have no um, tariffs on them. And mm -hmm. that's 90% of the business is then they're going, trying to encourage the business to take place amongst African nations and not uh, to, the, to, to actually be doing the 80% of what has been going out in export trade, in globalization, because that has not been friendly to Africa. Is um, that the African know, Continental Free Trade Area? It's the African Continental Free Trade Area, exactly, ACFA, exactly that. Um, and do and, and you know what? That this is going to become the single largest economic union when they put it together, It'll be 1.2 billion people, uh, and it will have a GDP of something like three trillion dollars. Now, so how does that sit with our views on globalization? What they're saying actually is, Africa, get yourself together, trade amongst yourself, build up your own economy, build up your infrastructure, find uh, find your own level in this uh, world, in this economic world, and not be ripped off essentially and exploited by businesses. Uh, and I'm in business in Africa, by the way. So, you know, the accusation could well be uh, thrown at myself. But businesses and governments and, and, and the European Union, if you want, or maybe even some, some places in America as well. Any case, that was, sorry, that was just my... No, no, no. Listen, I, no, that was very, very interesting. Listen, ge gentlemen, we're, we're getting to the end of our uh, very lively and interesting discussion. I'd like to, in the next remo remaining moments, if everybody can briefly... Um, just give you, share your impressions about what you think is important for uh, our audience to understand about globalization and uh, what you think is important to impart uh, uh, at the end of this discussion, if you can briefly. Well, very briefly, um, I just wanted to say uh, to Michael, yes, he's absolutely right. This is the, way, the right way to approach globalization. 
to have these free trade movements, these free trade agreements to deal with each other. The problem in Africa that still is to solve is the insecurity for many people and for many governments that are just not working the way they should be. But it's the right approach to have this free trade agreement and to have the biggest ever seen free trade area. Um, that's the way to prosperity. That's the way that uh, they sh that we should continue globally. Fantastic. Thank you. I would just say um, for people watching, uh, I believe most of our audience are all people who are not really paying a high price in COVID relative to most of the world. We're at the risk of losing maybe 20 years of development progress globally in terms of, of livelihoods. So this is a, a an economic crisis and livelihood crisis uh, that is just staggering and heartbreaking. And so. Uh, we are going to need to find ways not only to, to solve these challenges in our own countries, but make sure that we are creating awareness and creating the relationships of the need to make sure we keep investing, um, not just at the institutional level, but I think there's going to be a huge need for aid and development to help families just survive COVID and then do the rebuilding communities so that the, the whole sort of global economic engine uh, keeps moving back and we don't exacerbate uh, what is rampant inequality. Because if we do, I think then we will continue to see political and social upheaval that then hurts, uh, hurts the recovery for everyone. Thank you so much. Who has not spoken? Who's left here? Right. Give me their summation. Steve, I think I got, uh, just, just a piece in here is that uh, I think this panel was fantastic because I think it really encapsulated both the opportunity and the challenge in globalization, which is there are huge opportunities for, for us to partner, like Jonathan said, to address true problems like COVID is, but we have to recognize the difficulties in globalization in being able to uh, protect and, and recognize and respect the equities of everyone in that agreement to include the emerging nations. And the only way that we're going to get there is by maintaining that triple bottom line value set that Alex. Thank you so much, Steve. I'd like to thank Michael Hacking, Matt Hellstrom, Alexander Kulitz, Jonathan uh, Reckford, and Steve Wall for a, a fascinating discussion. I've enjoyed being with all of you. Uh, I think uh, we've all learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time and participation. Thanks, thank you, Beth. Well, well, well done, Beth. Thank you, gentlemen. You were fantastic. You were fantastic. And I, I'm sorry for the scare at the beginning of, you, of, losing, <laughs> your moderator, of losing your moderator. But no, it was fascinating. And uh, I hope you all feel that you got to say what that was important to you. I thought you, you all had fantastic points. And I thought the discussion on Africa, I mean, just from, from the, from Habitat to Humanity to the, to parliaments to, to, to the Baltimore Harbor idea and to, uh, uh, Africa was just so interesting to me. I, I thank you so much for the time, everybody. It was great. Wow, this was a delight. Michael, we gotta we gotta talk. I really I really <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and I hope we all see each other in uh in Portugal in June. I'm I'm hoping to go. Is everybody else planning to go there if possible? Well, uh, I still have some tickets that British Airways owes me, so yeah. hoping but unsure. Uh, yeah, no, nobody's sure of anything. Nobody is sure of anything. But anyhow, I'm glad the technology worked. And again, it was such a pleasure to meet all of you. I, I hope we I hope we meet in person. Do we have emails, uh, Steve? I don't know whether where you. Uh, you send uh, emails. I can I can send oh, everything. Beth, you've got them, haven't you? So you usually, when we have the big meeting, they put out the contact info at the end, Beth. Did yeah, and you should on the emails I've been sending each of you. You should have everybody's email. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, we're on a group. Thank so you, Ron. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. You all, thank you. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Jonathan. Nice to meet you, Alex. Bye. Yep. Right. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay, we're good.